Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Zion today. A special welcome to you who have joined us online. We're glad that you were able to join this worship service. It is August 22nd, 2021. It is the 13th Sunday of the Pentecost season as we continue here. And our theme, therefore, continues to be we are free. And we'll see again as the Apostle Paul emphasizes that truth in a rather unique way in our message from God's Word today. Selected as the readings for this Sunday, we'll also note that God frees us in a very special way by giving us a wisdom that we can't gain in our schools that are beginning this week in our colleges and universities, but a unique wisdom that is, makes us wise for salvation through God's Word and the one who is wisdom for us, our Savior, Jesus. So we'll also watch for that. As we worship, we'll be following the order of service. I'm going to be looking forward to today, the common service with, the cel- with no celebration of the Lord's Supper, but uh, we have the uh, hymns for us printed in the worship folder. Uh, we begin with our first one, number 222, Songs of Praise the Angels Sang. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful God, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, 
Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on us, Christ, have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord today using the hymn that's printed for you in your worship folder and on the screen. Peace to those who love him well. On the earth let all his people speak his grace, his wonders tell. Lord, we praise you for your glory, mighty Father, heaven's King. Hear our joyful adoration and accept the thanks we bring. Only Son of God the Father, Lamb who takes our sin away. Now with him in triumph seated, for your mercy, Lord, we pray. Jesus Christ, most high and holy, Savior, you are God alone. In the glory of the Father, with the Spirit, three in one. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift of grace that we come into your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. As we turn our attention to God's word today, he speaks to us, first of all, through the Old Testament book of Proverbs. In this section from Proverbs 9, we find that wisdom, uh, an abstract concept, is actually personified, which means it's spoken of as if it was a person. And watch what this person, this wisdom, is doing for us and the blessings he intends to give us. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants, and she calls from the highest point of the city, let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, come, eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. Here ends our first lesson from God's word. We join together now in singing our psalm for today, Psalm 1, printed in your worship folders. We'll sing it in unison. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, 
But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever he does prospers. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Our second lesson is recorded for us in Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus chapter 5. The Apostle Paul is again addressing that whole concept of being wise, being, having wisdom. And in that first lesson, when it talked about the simple, it wasn't talking about people who, who don't have a lot of intelligence. It was talking about people who humble themselves before God. Those are the simple. And Paul is addressing them here too and reminding them that they really need to be filled with something much more important than intelligence. Paul writes, Be very careful in how you... because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, and make music from your heart to the Lord, Here ends our second lesson from God's Word. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Alleluia. 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 Please stand. The Holy Gospel for today is recorded in the Gospel according to St. John, not St. Mark. St. John, chapter 6, beginning with the 51st verse. Glory be to you, O Lord. We heard in that first lesson about wisdom personified. The scripture tells us that Jesus himself is wisdom from God. And here, as the one, the wisdom that we heard in Proverbs, we hear Jesus inviting us to a meal. As you hear these words also, I'd like to remind you that in this section of Scripture, Jesus is not talking about the Lord's Supper. He's simply uh, characterizing our believing in him as eating from him. We hear from Jesus. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. 
Just as the Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Here ends the gospel lesson. Praise be to you, O Christ. We join now in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed printed in your worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue our service with our hymn of the day, number 325, How Blessed Are They Who Hear. Dear friends in Christ, the word of God that we're going to be looking at today are the words as we continue looking at that letter that Paul wrote to the Galatian Christians. Today we're in the fourth chapter reading verses 21 to 31 where Paul continues and writes, Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are to be taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. 
Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. This is the word of our God. Your friends, I'm going to begin today with a test. You have to answer, so get ready. The test has to do with the history of Abraham and Sarah. So when God first came to Abraham and Sarah, Abraham was 75 years old and Sarah was 65. And how many children did they have? One. Zero. Good. One for one. Why didn't they have any children? God's will. Okay. Because Sarah was barren, right? She didn't have any children. And in fact, she was 65 years old, so she was probably already at the point where she couldn't have any children. After 10 years of waiting to have a child, Sarah came up with a plan. And we might even think that Sarah was being honorable here because she was allowing another woman to be the one that would give a promised son to Abraham. And her plan was that Abraham should take a slave that she had from Egypt as his wife and have a child through that slave woman. And so that's what Abraham did. And that slave woman's name was? Hagar. Hagar. Okay. So Hagar and Abraham had a son. And his name was? Ishmael. Good. Ishmael. Now, 14 years later, at the time that Ishmael was born, Abraham was 86, Sarah was now 76. 14 years later, Sarah had a son. She also gave birth, and that son's name was Isaac. After Isaac had been born, a little while after, we're told sometime just after he was weaned, that teenage son, Ishmael, started mocking him and making fun of him. And so Sarah heard about that, and she was bothered by it. And she came to Abraham and said, put away, send away that woman and her son, because that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Abraham didn't know whether he should do that or not, so he checked with the Lord, which was a good thing. And the Lord said, go ahead and do it. That's right. Listen to what Sarah said, says. And so he sent away Hagar and Ishmael. This is history. This is factual. This really happened on this earth at a time long ago. So after Paul tells us about this history, then Paul says that these things are an allegory. Or as the NIV puts it, these are things which can be understood figuratively. An allegory is literally something which is said but can say other or something deeper. An allegory can be a historical story or it can be another story that's made up that on the surface can make sense by itself, but then there's an other meaning, another meaning, if you will. A couple of examples from our literature might help a little bit. Some of you may be familiar with one of the most famous allegories. A lot of time it's studied in high school, but it's uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. An animal farm is about a bunch of animals that kick the humans off the, the farm and take over. On the surface, it, it's like a kid's story. But there's a deeper meaning. There's an other meaning to it, and that other meaning has to do with the Russian Revolution. 
Many people think that Alice in Wonderland is an allegory. On the surface, it's kind of a kid's story. It has a lot of likable characters and kind of neat plot. But beneath that, there's an other meaning that people say it's about things that were going on in Victorian England. Well, Paul then now is taking some history, some actual factual history, and says that it has an other, a deeper meaning to it. Now, we need to be careful here. We can't just go willy-nilly into Scripture and take all kinds of historical things and, and turn them into allegory. That's what some people try to do. They try to, to make much of Scripture an allegory. Some people do that with the first chapters of Genesis, for example. They say that creation didn't really happen. That's just an allegorical story that's telling us about our relationship with God or our relationship with one another. But you see, Scripture never tells us that. Scripture never treats creation as an allegory. In fact, it doesn't create creation or Adam and Eve as anything but real people living at a real time as history. But here in our text today, we see that sometimes God himself tells us, as he does through the Apostle Paul, his inspired writer, that a portion of Scripture is to have a deeper meaning, is to be allegory. And so Paul here uses this story of Abraham and Sarah which has a very simple plot to it, to bring something that's maybe a little more difficult to understand into a very simple way so that his readers in Galatian can really get this point that he's been making throughout the book of his letter of Gal to the Galatians. And he begins by making the significant certain parts of the history of Abraham and Sarah. For example, number one, he says both of them, or Abraham, had two sons. One of those sons, Ishmael, was the slave son of a slave woman by the name of Hagar. The other son, Isaac, was born of a free woman, Sarah. Secondly, he calls attention to the fact that they have very different circumstances in their births. Ishmael, the slave son, was born in the natural way that women normally conceive and give birth to children. But Isaac was born only according to a promise. Remember that Sarah was barren. And by the time that she gave birth to Isaac, she was well past the age of giving birth to a child. Her body had no eggs left for her to conceive in the normal way that parents conceive. She was able to give birth only because of the miraculous gift that God gave through his spirit to her to be able to bear a child. And so God made this unquestionable that this child was truly a child of promise. Now, after listing that history, then Paul also mentions a little bit of the later history, and that was that that slave child from Hagar began to mock and make fun of and persecute the son of the promise. With those three historical facts in our minds, then Paul says, now, you need to understand these things can be taken allegorically. There's an other meaning to them. And he says, those two women, Hagar and Sarah, represent two covenants that God made with his people. Hagar represents the covenant that was made at Mount Sinai, which means she represents the law covenant, the covenant that was made with Moses and the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. And so just as Hagar is a slave woman who gives birth to Ishmael, a slave son, so those who are under that covenant made at Mount Sinai are slave children of Hagar. And Paul says that they're like the earthly Jerusalem at that time because many, if not most of the people in Jerusalem, continued to believe that they were saved by what they did in life, by following God's Old Testament laws. Just like those Judaizers who had come from Jerusalem and were troubling the Galatians by trying to proclaim to them that they needed to follow the Old Testament laws. But by doing that, those people were all slaves. And that's true of anyone who continues to think that they can be saved by what they do or by who they are, then they remain slaves and they are Hagar's children and they get no inheritance. On the other hand, Sarah 
represents a new covenant. She represents the covenant that was made with Abraham, which ultimately is the covenant from that promised Jesus the Savior. And so Sarah is the mother of free people. She's the mother of believers, those who believe that Jesus is their Savior. And she, Paul says, represents the Jerusalem that's above. And that means the Jerusalem that is the Holy Christian Church, made up of all believers. And we might think of a passage like Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 in that connection where it says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as Paul uses this allegory, he isn't the first person in Scripture to do that because Paul even quotes from Isaiah in chapter 54 where Isaiah says, Be glad, barren woman, you who never had a bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. So here in this Old Testament quote, we hear about a barren woman, again, a woman who has no children, and yet we're told that she's going to have far more children than a woman who had a husband. It's very clear that that also is pointing to Sarah. She's being represented here. And she, though she was barren in her life, had more children than any other woman because her children are children of promise, like Isaac. They're children who are believers, and there are many, many, many believers that came who believed that promise, and she is their mother. Paul says to the Galatian Christians, you, like Isaac, are children of the promise. Therefore, don't be surprised if the Judaizers begin to persecute you because they aren't children of the promise. They're children of Hagar, the slave children of the law. And just like Ishmael persecuted Isaac, so they are going to persecute you. But what did Abraham do? He sent the slave children, the slave and, and her child, away. And so Paul is telling the Galatian Christians, don't listen to the Judaizers. Send them away. Don't let them take you and make you slaves again with them to laws because you are the children of freedom in the freedom of the gospel. So the message is simple, isn't it? And it's simple for us to understand today too. The question that begs an answer is, who is your mother? If we ever begin to think that we are saved by who we are or what we do, then we are Hagar's children. We are children of slavery. We're children who are still under the law of Moses, and we are not free, and we will not receive the inheritance. But if we cling to Jesus... If we remember that Jesus did away with that Old Testament law, if we remember that God's gift to us is eternal life in Jesus because of Jesus, then we are Sarah's children, and we are free. And the inheritance, eternal life, is indeed ours. Does that mean if we are free, that we don't have to listen to the government anymore, that we don't have to listen to the traditions of the church anymore, that we can just live a lawless life? Well, we're going to discuss that a little bit more in three Sundays because Paul's going to take up that very point. So make sure you're here in three Sundays to hear the answer. But today, we are concerned about the heavenly Jerusalem, not living here on earth. Today, we're concerned about the promise. Today, we're concerned about how we get to heaven. And when we talk about salvation, then there is no law then there is no obedience to rules. Then there's only Jesus. We are Sarah's children, free, so that we have salvation and fear of God and fear of our conscience is, is gone because of the death and resurrection of our Jesus for us. You go back to the very first thing that Paul said to the Galatian Christians in this section that we're studying today. He asks them a very pointed question. He says, tell me, you who want to be under law, 
Do you hear what the law says? Now, Paul's using law there in two different ways. The first time he's using it of the law that Moses gave, the moral, the civil, and the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. And he says those who want to be under that law. The second time he uses it, he's using it in a broader sense, as Scripture often uses it, to mean all of the writings of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, including the writings that he does about the history of God's people. And so Paul's point is that those who are wanting to be under the laws of the Old Testament still are not remembering that God, throughout the Old Testament, had shown his people that they are only saved through faith. And that includes through historical things which God guided so that they could be used by God even allegorically as he does for us today. So if you still don't understand the difference between law and gospel, between law and the promise, just look at these two women, Hagar and Sarah and their two sons. Who gets the inheritance? Who is driven out? The one who is born of the promise gets the inheritance. The one who is born in a natural way, by natural means, is driven out. And they represent those who are still under the law and are driven away from God. And those who are children of the promise and are saved because they are believers. So the simple question today is, who is your mother? And dear friends, by God's grace alone, we can confidently say, we are children of of the free woman. Amen. Please stand as we join in the Create in Me. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and Spirit within me, cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we remind you that out of thanksgiving to our God who has set us free, we have the opportunity to give our gifts of thanks to him through our offerings. You may do that by dropping them in the plate at the back of our chapel or using the electronic means described in our, our worship folder. At this time, we invite Tyler Jilk to come forward for a reception of a new member, Sir Wright. Dear members of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church, by transfer from St. Michael's Lutheran Church in Fountain City, Wisconsin, Tyler Jilk has been received into membership by the Church Council of our congregation. Today, we publicly receive him into membership. Brother in Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ promises to confess before his Father in heaven those who faithfully confess him on earth. You have come before this congregation to declare your faith and unite with us in Christian love and fellowship. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then declare so by saying, I do. I do. Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the word of God? Then declare so by saying, I do. I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith? Be diligent in the use of God's word and sacraments and lead a godly life, even to death, 
then declare so by saying, I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you support with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings the work of our Lord has given to this congregation? Then declare so by saying, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love, and invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please stand for prayer. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you joined this brother in Christ to your church when he was born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught him your saving truth, Grant that we may offer, he may offer himself as a living sacrifice to you as his spiritual act of worship. Transform him by the renewing of his mind so that he will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome, brother, and depart in peace. We continue with our prayer of the church, followed by the Lord's Prayer as printed in your worship folder. Let us pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we praise and thank you that you sent to us your Son, Jesus Christ, who is wisdom, through whom we have wisdom that brings us into everlasting life. We thank you that through him also, and through faith in him, you have set us free, free from laws, free from the fear of our God, free to serve you as your dear children. We ask that you would bless us and continue to bless us through your word that we maintain that freedom all our life until finally we reach the ultimate freedom of being with you in eternity. In our freedom, O oh Lord, as Christians, we come to you on behalf of a world that is so enslaved, enslaved by so many false teachings, enslaved by terrible disasters that have affected us even again in this last week and we pray that your mercy would be upon our world. We pray that you would be with those people in Haiti who have suffered from another earthquake, and especially that you would be with our missionary there who continues to bring them the comfort and uh, joy of the message of forgiveness and a God who still loves them even in times of disaster. We pray that you would be with us as we continue to suffer under the pangs of the coronavirus pandemic. We ask that you would bring more and more people to know you, even as people are dying without that knowledge, O oh Lord. We pray that you would use us as your ministers in our world to, to bring the message of Jesus to more people so that they may know you and even death cannot take them away from the gift that you have given them of eternal life. We ask these things, O oh Lord, in your name. And in Jesus' name, we also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, number 538, The Church's One Foundation.
Please stand. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen, amen, amen. Please be seated. We conclude our service with the final hymn, number 251, When Morning Gilds the Skies. Good morning again, and welcome to you all. Sorry about the labyrinth that you had to go through to get here this morning. Glad that you made it, <laughs> most of you got here uh, without too much trouble. So um, thank you for coming and, and weaving your way around to get to our congregation. I think this should be all gone by next week. I think they'll be done today, so we shouldn't have that problem again. 
A couple of reminders, if you haven't watched the Wells Connection yet, uh, the August Wells Connection, please do so. Uh, it's in your worship folder. The best way to get to it is bring up the electronic worship folder that's in that email that I send out, and then just click on the link and it'll take you right to that August Wells Connection video. It'll only be up this Sunday and next Sunday yet, and then the new September one will be posted. So uh, please watch it one of these next couple of Sundays and see what's going on in our synod. A reminder also to you that uh, we have Bible class on Wednesday evenings. It's a virtual Bible class from 7 to 8 o'clock, and a link is sent out for that. So consider joining us. Spend an hour in the, the midweek part of your, your life in order to continue to be strengthened and learn more about God's Word. Then finally, we do have some snacks downstairs, and following that, we continue our Bible class that we have on Sunday mornings. Uh, as we enjoy those snacks together, take the opportunity to welcome Tyler to our congregation as, as you uh, see him down there this morning. God's blessings to you during the week.